لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Ask Huda, this very special Ask Huda. I'm sure you can, you can hear the new sheets there. Very, very special Ask Huda. We we're going to discuss the issues regarding Hajj. We did start it in the previous episode. We're going to carry on in this episode. I'm happy to say with me the guy who's really doing the hard work today, Sheikh Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah, Sheikh, for being with us today. Wa jazakum. Okay, uh, like I said before, this episode of Ask Huda, we're going to go through all your questions and queries about that sacred journey. Yes, the journey to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the journey of a lifetime, of course, Hajj. Please, if you want to call us, try to keep it on the topic of Hajj. Uh, you can call us on our telephone numbers, country code 202 248 or 249. And of course, you can email us at ask at huda.tv. I know many of you emailed. We've gone through from 700 emails up to about 300. We've got many still pending, but we've done quite a lot. So please do bear with us. We've got a lot of emails and a lot of you wanting uh, to know more about the special duties regarding Hajj. Sheikh, if I can start with this. We did carry on from the last episode. We spoke uh, about Tawaf. Okay, and we spoke about starting tawaf and how to do it, what types of tawaf. And sometimes we see people who are doing tawaf who enter a part of the Kaaba, but they're stopped. They're stopped by the guards. The guards said, This is not a place you can actually do your tawaf within. And this is the hijr, this is a semicircle next to the Kaaba. If we can start off with the Sheikh, uh, why are they stopped from doing tawaf using this, uh, this way? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wal Aqibatu Lil Muttaqeen. ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد praise be to Allah alone we praise him and we seek his help whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one and whomsoever Allah leads astray no one can show him guidance الطواف is seven rounds around the كعبة beginning from the black stone corner and in and up at the same spot and it is done counterclockwise. And I said around the Kaaba, not from inside the Kaaba. With the meaning, if the door of the Kaaba is open, and one enters and makes tawaf inside, that is an invalid tawaf. For your information, uh, there is a historical fact that the Kaaba used to have two doors, an entry and an exit. So people used to come in and out easily, even ordinary people. You don't have to be a, a king or a president in order to get, to get such a great honor. So when uh, the Meccans reconstructed the Kaaba, the Prophet ﷺ was uh, approximately at the age of 35 uh, before he was appointed with the prophethood. But uh, these people, the Meccans, even the pagans before Islam, realized the sacredness of the Kaaba. So they made certain that they would not invest in the construction of the Kaaba any penny that was earned from unlawful earning. And they announced that only those who make sure that their charity or their spending on the construction of the Kaaba is purely from lawful sources, you may come in, you may fetch in. So when they decided that they ran out of money, they, they ran out of fund, and that's why they could not complete the, constru- the entire construction of the Kaaba. So instead of building the entire thing, they were short. And uh, if you notice, there is a half circle or the arch, which many people call it Hajj Ismail, which is called Al Hajj, that half circle. Mm-hmm. This part is initially from the Kaaba. So that's why, well, everything happens for a reason. Now, even though the Kaaba door is closed and uh, not everybody can get to enter the Kaaba and pray inside, but the Hajj is open for everyone. That if you pray in this area, that is similar to praying inside the Kaaba because this part is originally from the Kaaba. That's why the guards are stopping at one entry that is parallel or next to, adjacent to the black stone corner. Because many pilgrims, those who do not know this historical fact, they like to enter, maybe to take a shortcut, they see the wall of the Kaaba, so I would like to make a shortcut. Why do I have to make this long circle? Because if you make this shortcut, this whole round does not count. You have to make up another one. So if they end up um, making tawaf from inside Al-Hajj, the entire tawaf is invalid. And we said it should be seven rounds. That's why 
the person must make tawaf around al-hajj, not from within sight. And if the guards prevent you, do not feel bad, do not get hurt, because this is for your welfare. Uh, yet they allow you to enter from the other side, which is the exit basically during regular times. Why? Because they know that if you are entering from here, you are not entering to make tawaf, or otherwise it will be clockwise. Rather you are entering to pray. So after you finish your tawaf, it's recommended to pray these two rak'ahs inside the hajj, which will be considered as inside the Kaaba. Anywhere particularly inside the hajj, I mean, is there, all of that is part of the Kaaba? And the closest to the Kaaba, mm-hmm. a few yards from the wall of the Kaaba, that belongs to the Kaaba as well. Okay, and so. the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said mm-hmm. to Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, that if it is not that your people were new to Islam, mm-hmm. I would have reconstructed the Kaaba on the original foundations which Ibrahim السلام, raised and erected the building of the Kaaba on. But the Prophet وسلم, decided not to do anything which com- could confuse uh, the people. That's why some people ask me, why only the two corners, a black stone corner and a Ruknul Yamani that we get to touch? Because these are the only two corners of the original foundations of the Kaaba. The other two corners were short several yards short from the original uh, original foundations of the Kaaba. Exactly, Khashik. Okay, as usual, we've got uh, quite a few questions from the SMS. Uh, if you want to send us a, a question via the SMS, you've got the country uh, telephone number. It should be turning your turn soon. So you can send us an, an SMS, and we'll try and tackle in this episode, especially on the subject of Hajj, if possible, if you can keep it to the topic. Um, you've got a question about Tawaf, actually. Uh, the sister Breen's asking, um, is it true that we cannot perform Tawaf on behalf of a living or deceased person, Sheikh? No, you cannot perform tawaf on behalf of anybody else, whether he's present or absent. Mm-hmm. You may perform tawaf if you're sick or healthy, walking or riding mm-hmm. on the back of a ride or on a wheelchair. That's perfectly fine, no problem. The Prophet ﷺ performed tawaf once while he was riding on the back of his camel. Mm-hmm. That is okay. But a tawaf is similar to a salah, except that in a salah we do not speak a word other than what's prescribed of the recitation of the Quran and the adhkar. But in a tawaf one may speak outside uh, the regular adhkar. So a tawaf similar to a salah with regards to the requirement of a tahara, mm-hmm. and also uh, that you cannot do it on behalf of somebody else. You can never pray on behalf of somebody else. You may fast instead of somebody. You may give charity instead of somebody. Give the word of that to somebody else, but not tawaf. And that will take us to another very important thing, which is a common mistake that people who are going for the first time to perform hajj and umrah, out of their keenness to do everything rightly, sometimes they uh, commit this mistake. We all know that there is, upon entering in a masjid there is a tradition or a sunnah, two rak'ahs, which are known as tahiyyat al-masjid. These are essential sunnahs to the point that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was given khutbah al-jum'ah, he noticed that somebody entered the masjid and he sat down. So he said, have you prayed? He said, no. He said, get up and pray two sajdas or two rak'ahs, mm-hmm. tahiyyat al-masjid. And that was repeated twice in two consecutive jum'ahs. So some people, when they enter al-masjid al-haram, they pray but they're not praying the regular or the current prayer, they're praying Tahiyatul Masjid. We say no. Tahiyatul Masjid if there is no current prayer. So if there is no fard that you need to pray, then go to the tawaf directly. What about Tahiyatul Masjid? Every Masjid requires Tahiyah, including the prophetic Masjid, except Al Masjid Al Haram. Its Tahiyah, its greeting is a tawaf. That also means. If you're not planning to do tawaf, if you're entering during regular times, waiting for uh, the prayer time to come, praying night prayer, then in this condition you should still pray the Hayyat al-Mashr. But if you're doing tawaf, it's either one of the two. If you're doing tawaf, that weighs the two rakas of the greeting of al-Mashr al-Haram. Jazakallah khashik. Okay, now you've started the topic of tawaf, so I'm going to ask you something which uh, I know many people, to them it's strange. And actually, it is not strange, it's just uh, slightly relevant that the person who was running between the two mountains, especially when it comes to Sa'i after the Tawaf, no. uh, was uh, Hajjad. 
But when it comes to the, the women, okay, now the reason I'm talking about this is because in the Tawaf, the men are told to, to run faster for a certain period. And in the Sa'i, the men are also told to run faster for a certain period. But even you spoke about it in the last episode, you said, but not for the women. I'm just saying, why not for the women? Especially when it's Hajar who was ch- looking for the water. This is right. There are several things related to that. Number one, we said among the traditions of Tawaf, not every Tawaf, only the very first Tawaf, mm-hmm. which we named it Tawaf al Qudum or Tawaf al Umrah, the arrival Tawaf mm-hmm. or the Tawaf that is appointed as one of the pillars of the Umrah, the second pillar of the Umrah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ordered his companions to walk briskly. Mm-hmm. That is a tradition which is known as al Ramal. So there are two things: al Iqba and covering the right shoulder, and al Ramal. And a ramal will be only limited to the first three rounds of the very first tawaf, tawaf al qudum or tawaf al umrah. So that means in tawaf al ifada, in tawaf al ziyara, it's also called tawaf al ziyara, in tawaf al wada, in the voluntary tawaf which you may do at any say time, mm-hmm. you should not do neither one of the previous, al ittaba nor a ramen. Mm-hmm. In addition to women are not allowed to walk briskly or jog or hasten while walking because their bodies are aura and they should protect that. You asked a very intelligent question. You said, we are following the footsteps of Hajar, peace be upon her, mm-hmm. who kept jogging between As-Safa and Marwa and at a certain area she used to hasten and jog hardly mm-hmm. because she won't be able to see Ismail. So she would really hasten in this area. It is present until today and it is recommended for those who are doing sa'i of the men between the two green markers to jog. But women are not allowed to jog here or there. And he said, how come that we're following the footsteps of Hajar Mm. and women are not allowed to do it? Well, Hajar was doing this for what reason? Searching for the water and she was worried about Ismail. That's her reason. But you sisters are doing this to commemorate the remembrance of Hajar and comply with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the commander in this regard said that women are not allowed to jog. Even if a woman is in the company of her mahram, husband, father, brother, son, or whatever. So for him, he would jog and he would wait at the end of the second green light Mm -hmm. or flag or marker. And he would wait for her until she would come with comfort. Mm-hmm. She should not hasten, she should not rush, <coughs> nor jack. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Okay, I've got another question from the SMS which has just come through. Um, the sister's saying, Assalamu alaikum, if one is coming from Asia to perform Hajj and they go past the Miqat point, now for example, they go straight to Medina, Medina for example, they pass the Miqat, but on the way back from Medina, they're going to go to one of the Miqat and enter Ihram. Are they allowed to do this, which is go past the Miqat without entering Ihram, Shaykh? What determines when should you announce your intention of Ihram for the Umrah or the Hajj is where is your destination? Mm-hmm. Are you going directly to Mecca from your beginning point from Amsterdam, from Lahore in Pakistan, mm-hmm. from Egypt, from Cairo? If this is the case, then at the appointed Miqat, mm-hmm. Al Juhfa, for instance, if you're coming from Cairo, that you must make your intention of Ihram in the plane or in the ship or by the bus. But if you're not going directly to Mecca, you're going to maybe Riyadh, you're going to Al Medina first, you can hang around for one week or so, then your Miqat will differ accordingly and will be according to your new point where you're taken off from to mm-hmm. make Hajj or Umrah. So if you go to Al Medina first, then after a few days you're planning to come to Mecca, your Miqat now is not Al Juhfa or Yalamlam or that Arq, whatever, but your Miqat will be. Dhul Hulayfa, or what's known as Abyar Ali, where there is a masjid there, you can uh, pray if there is a due prayer, and make the ihram as well. Only if you're <coughs> coming directly to Mecca, then you should not pass the miqat on the way without making the ihram. Jazakallah khash. Okay, another question from the SMS. Um, the sister wants to know, what's the difference in regards to wearing the niqab uh, the covering that covers your face uh, in the Hajj Umrah time. Uh, she says basically she knows that we're not allowed to wear it, but there is a type of face covering you are allowed to wear, she's saying. What's the difference here? That is right. In Ihram, mm-hmm. the Ihram of women is in their hands and face. 
So they should not cover neither one of them, the hands nor the face. Mm-hmm. Yet according to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha ardaha, if you happen to be around men who are stranger, not your mahram, then you're allowed to lower your isdal, which you are on top of your head to cover your face. Some sisters make sure to wear a cap to keep the isdal uh, distant from their faces, thinking that if it touches the face, then that ruins their ihram. No, that's not necessary. Lowering the isdal would be only limited to if you are around or surrounded with men who are strangers. That means, once you enter the elevator to the hotel, and you are by yourself or around women, then you should uncover. Once you enter the room, or you sit in the musalla of the ladies, that you must make sure that hands and face are uncovered. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Okay, we've got a question, and it's a quite interesting question, Sheikh. Is it true that before you go to Hajj, you must release any pets that you have kept in captivity, let them go free? Go around. I have no such reference to anything like that. Whatever you feel that will make you comfortable, mm-hmm. And uh, will relieve your conscience from any pain. You must do it before going for Hajj. As I stated in the last time, going for Hajj should expiate the previous sins, not including the sins which are related to human rights or animal rights. For human rights, unless if you ask the person whom you have wronged to pardon you and to forgive you. So if you know that you're imprisoning a pet for no reason and you're not taking care of her mm-hmm. we all know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said a woman has entered the fire of hell for a kitten she imprisoned she neither fed the kitten nor let it go to eat from the street so accordingly it died so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala took her to fire took the lady who imprisoned the kitten to fire mm-hmm. but if you have a pet at home that you're taking care of there is no problem whatsoever Jazakallah khair Sheikh. Okay, we've got a question now, which is a question that uh, people do ask. It comes up all the time. And you spoke about it. Say those brothers and sisters who are making this Hajj Tamattu. So they're going to come and they're going to pray Umrah and they're going to do the Umrah, then have a, a week or two until uh, Dhul Hijjah starts and go to Mina. And they decide to go to Medina. Uh, many people say, well, actually, you're not allowed to leave the compounds or the, the, the you know, vicinity of, ha- of Mecca itself. Mm-hmm. Now, how valid is this, Sheikh? Could you just uh, clarify this for us? Uh, this is actually short and lack of understanding. Jazakallah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ تَمَتَّعَ بِالْعُمْرَةِ إِلَى الْحَجِّ فَمَا اسْتَيْصَرَ مِنَ الْحَجِّ mm-hmm. So, التَمَتَّعَ means to do the Umrah any time during the time which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about it in Surah Al-Baqarah, Al-Hajju Ashhurun Ma'lumat. Mm-hmm. Ashur is plural of shahr, mm-hmm. which means months. That's two months and ten days, beginning from the first day of Shawwal, mm-hmm. right after Ramadan. Shawwal, Dhul Qa'da, the whole Shawwal, and the whole Dhul Qa'da, and the first ten days of uh, Dhul Hijjah. So if any person does the Umrah during this time and does not return home, he is still in a state of tamatta. So if the person goes to al Medina to visit the prophetic masjid, since the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recommended visiting his masjid, and he did not allow sitting out a journey in a journey or a trip to any masjid but one of the three, al Masjid al-Haram and the prophetic masjid and the farthest mosque in Jerusalem, then it is permissible. And he is still in a state of tamatta, not necessarily in ihram though. Jazakallah khashak. Okay, the first caller day, Sister Farida from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Sister, you're live on Ask Kuda. Your question, please. Sister Farida, are you with us? Oh, Salaam alaykum. Oh, Salaam alaykum. Wallahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I just got a question regarding the wudu during uh, tawaf. Hmm. Uh, how easy can it be become or, or for, for the females in tawaf uh, with regards to keeping their wudu in the zahra? Okay. 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 Oh, okay, Sheikh, regarding the, the tawaf now, okay? Please. In the zahma. In the zahma, <laughs> okay, mashallah. Zahma, of course, is the traffic, is the, the, the amount of people, mashallah. Um, regarding tawaf, Sheikh, what are the conditions of performing tawaf? Is it like salah you have to have? As wudu? I said, like salah, it requires tahara, full mm-hmm. tahara from mm-hmm. the minor and the major impurity. And that means if any person, male or female, void their wudu in the middle of the tawaf, regardless, it's really crowded or what? They have to seize their tawaf and to step out to do wudu. And uh, by the way, al wudu does not require the person to use the bathroom before it or to do what we call it instant jah or wash the privates if it was just passing wind or releasing gas. 
So that's why there are available places where you can make a quick wudu inside al-masjid at the Zamzam water uh, fountains. So this is one thing. But if you felt that there is some impurities that came out, then you have to go out and make sure that you remove the impurities, wash your privates, and make wudu, then come back and resume. Exactly, Khashak. Okay, now I've got a question from the email. I've got quite a lot of questions on Hajj. But one of my, those which keeps sticking through is about picking up the stones. Where do we pick the stones up from? What sort of quantity stones? What sort of size of stones? Um, give us some guidance on this, Sheikh. And this is, for, of course, for the stoning of the Jamarat. I wonder that you didn't ask me about uh, casting or throwing <laughs> a Jamarat al Akhaba al Kubra or a Surah. Maybe we can, we can go through this. Slippers, <laughs> shoes, and uh, uh, cans. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he made ithaba, he mm-hmm. returned from Arafah and he spent the night in Al Muzdalifa, he began by praying Maghrib and Isha together, mm-hmm. obviously at the time of Isha. Then he prayed the witch. He asked one of his companions to collect for him just the seven pebbles, the size of the chickpeas, mm-hmm. very small. I would like to clarify a very important fact, which is it is not the size what matters, it is the compliance. Many people are under the impression that when we cast this pebble, which you should choose a big size because it would hurt Satan, that Allah is fastening the hands and the feet um, of Satan against this pole, and he's crucifying him there, and we are stoning him. This is not true. This is a symbolic thing. We do it in order to comply with Allah's command. We maintain their word and we fulfill the wajib, by complying, in addition to this compliance, what hurts is what hurts Satan the most. So we collect, if we want to collect seven pebbles from al Muzdalifa, that's fine. Some people waste the time, even before praying Maghrib and Isha, in collecting the pebbles for the next four days, the Eid day and the next three days. That's not allowed. Also, you don't have to worry about collecting the pebbles afterward for the entire set from Muzdalfa. You can collect them from anywhere, whether from Mina, next to your tent, or from Aziziya, from wherever you are, it doesn't matter. As long as you don't pick the used pebbles which are around or in the basin itself, which people have already uh, used or stoned before. So you're telling me slippers, cans, and all these big rocks, they're out? Uh, it, it may look funny when mm. some people do it sometimes but it is indeed awful and it is not civilized in addition to it is against the sunnah and it is a contradiction to what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said when he said khudu anni manasikakum i recall when somebody jumped into the basin when it was uh, uh, it was short and he took his shoes off and he started beating the pole saying that you misled me he was actually Cursing Satan. Well, that is due to ignorance. When people do not know why they are doing that, they end up committing things out of their whims and desire. And that pleases Satan the most. Okay, Jazakallah Khair, Sheikh. If I could just carry on with the stoning and just say, Sheikh, just tell us the, the basic requirements. How should it be thrown? I mean, do you have to hit the wall? Does it have to land into the area? What's the, the basic guidance? Nowadays, and since a couple of years now, we're having a huge wall. It's Allah. not a pole, it is not a pillar, it's a huge wall. I mean, you cannot miss it. And basically, what's required is that your stone fall within the basin that surrounds whether the pole or the wall. So if it falls outside, that doesn't count. And you should throw one at a time. You should stone one by one. Mm-hmm. So if you collect the seven at once and say, Allahu Akbar, and you throw them at once, that counts as one. You still have to make up six more. If you feel, or if you're afraid that your stone fell out, or it did not reach, it's very simple. Just throw another one, stone another one. Mm-hmm. And if it falls from your hand, that's okay, you can pick it up, you can use another one, there is no problem with that. One very important thing just crossed my mind right now is what I see some people washing the stones before using them. They're reciting some supplications or verses on them. All of that has no source of, or evidence whatsoever and we should not do anything that was not prescribed. Jazakallah Okay, with that, uh, we're going to take a short break, inshallah, and return 
in a couple of minutes. Please do stay with us. When we return, we're going to carry on with your questions about Hajj and the rights of Hajj and all those common mistakes that we see, unfortunately, happening every year at Hajj. Please do stay with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You know, sometimes it's important to take a break. We need to take a break. Take a break from what? From the everyday things to look at what we're really doing as Muslims. That's why we said we really need to have this program for you and for me to take a break right here on Huda TV. Stay with us because we've got a lot coming up on Take a Break. If you look into the early tafsir, early exegesis of the Quran, you will find that uh, all the mufassirin were trying to find out where are the seven earths. Earthquakes, natural or artificial, can delineate the boundaries between seven different zones within the earth. The, the conclusion that we have seven different layers within the earth came to notice only in the 20th century. The true believer would prostrate down in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the blessings of that prostration will reach the seventh earth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Ask Huda. This is a special episode of Ask Huda where we're going to tackle your questions regarding Hajj. We've got so many questions from brothers and sisters regarding the rites and the rituals and those things which fortunately are unclear to them. Please do telephone us. Our country code is 202. Then it's 38555, 248 or 249. Okay, Sheikh, I've got a question for you. Uh, Maqam Ibrahim, Sheikh. This is the place of Abraham. Um, what do people do regarding this? I mean, you see so many different kind of rituals happening with this maqam, Sheikh. What is its significance and, and how does it play a part, Sheikh? First of all, maqam Ibrahim is one of the symbols of this sacred place, mm-hmm. Al-Kaaba and its surrounding. Allah the Almighty mentioned it in the second chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, and says, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى He said, in it there are clear proofs and signs one of them is the station of Ibrahim. And this station of Ibrahim, what, what you see in, uh, in the showcase, mm-hmm. the golden showcase, it is just for protection and to prevent people from wiping on it or touching uh, and so on. Otherwise, Maqamu Ibrahim is just a stone, a brick that Ibrahim السلام, used to step on to be able to reach to continue the construction of the Kaaba when it was out of reach. So it has the marks of his feet, peace be upon him. Right? Hmm. And that is put in this cage as an indication this is what Ibrahim alayhi salam have used. Hmm. The, this stone was attached to the Kaaba. And people when they used to pray the two rakahs of Sunnah al Tawaf. He used to block the way of those who are performing tawaf. It was moved during the era of Umar ibn Khattab and so on further. And now they moved it even further more. Its significance is to look at it, to recognize that Ibrahim stepped on it one day. Other than that, there is no 
seeking the blessing by wiping or touching. You see women taking off their scarves to wipe on that showcase. It has no significance whatsoever. As a matter of fact, these practices by wiping in the showcase, whether your ihram, your hand, is an indication that you are looking for some blessing from this idol. And this is a contradiction of the concept of Tawheed in the core of the city of Tawheed, right in front of the Kaaba. Mm. As far as praying the two rakahs of Sunnah al Tawaf, the Prophet ﷺ prayed them in front of um, the station of Ibrahim or Maqam Ibrahim, the standing of Ibrahim. And it is recommended after performing each Tawaf to offer these two rakahs and recite in the first rakah. After Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Qul Ya Ayuha al kafirun And in the second rak'ah, after reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, you recite Surah Al-Ikhlas, Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad. As we said with regards to the black stone and Ruqn Al-Yamani, if it is crowded and it is indeed. We just saw the pictures, it's uh, crowded. Exactly. Like Imagine praying there. What does it mean? It means you're going to block a whole line of people who are performing tawaf. What's really strange is when somebody is afraid that somebody is going to cross before him, so mm-hmm. he appoints a bodyguard to make sure that people will not cross before him. We have to understand the concept of this ibadah, of this unique act of worship. The purpose is not to fulfill some physical activities. The purpose is to reflect on it. Anywhere in al you can pray these two rakahs anywhere as long as you're facing the Kaaba. Mm-hmm. Even if you end up praying them at Al-Masa, as long as you're facing uh, the Kaaba. Near Zamzam water, that is fine. I mean, step behind. Stay totally away from the, the track of people who are performing tawaf. That is indeed better for you and for them with regards to the world. Jazakal khair. Okay, now we're speaking about uh, tawaf and even Sai. We're coming on to those subjects now. Um, Sheikh, what happens when you're performing your tawaf or your Sai and in the middle of this, uh, the Iqamah goes, say, for one of the uh, Fard Salahs, say, for Dhuhr, Asr, for example. What do you do? How do you stop and resume? Uh, what's, the, what's the practice here? One thing I, I wish for is that everybody would hear the answer to this question. Because while we're praying in congregation behind the Imam in the Haram, you will find people still making tawaf. We prayed the first rak'ah, and the second rak'ah, and people are still trying to accomplish their tawaf. They miss the jama'ah and they're doing the tawaf. It doesn't make any sense. There is no contradiction or conflict of interest between both. Once it is the prayer time and the iqamah has been established, لا صلاة ولا كلام إلا المكتوبة. You should stop doing everything and join the jama'ah. What about my tawaf? There is only like a quarter of one round and I will finish. It doesn't matter. Join the jama'ah from the beginning takbir. And once the imam finishes the prayer, resume from the same spot where you stopped at. You don't have to start over. You don't even have to start this round from the black stone. From the same point, you continue and you resume. Same thing with those who are doing sa'i. Once you hear the iqama, you should seize your sa'i. You line up, you face the qibla, and you pray with the congregation. And if you miss the jama'ah, you just committed a sin while you are in al-masjid al-haram, while you are performing a ta'a and a ibad. And, and I, think the, the, I think the next logical question would be this breaking of, of doing a sa'i or tawaf, or doing one of the rounds. Um, what if somebody's ill or, say for example, somebody LD may be tired, chick, and they take a break? Rest, what take a break. Same thing? Take mm-hmm. a break, no problem. Mm-hmm. Whether you're doing the tawaf or you're doing the sa'i, you rest. And some people who are sick and they cannot afford to walk mm-hmm. between, do the sa'i between as safa and marwa, why do you have to burden yourself? لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Ask for a wheelchair. It's okay. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi did the tawaf while he was riding. No problem whatsoever. So do not hurt yourself nor burden yourself. I want you to save your power and energy for the big day. That day is the day of Arafah. People exhaust themselves and they waste their energy and they run out of power. And by the time it is Arafah, they're sick and they're worn out. Can you imagine? People who go early to perform Umrah, then they should wait until the eighth day to make a new intention for Hajj. 
they make one and two and three umrahs a day, which is not prescribed at all. This is a very common mistake that people do. Why do you do several umrahs? It's only one umrah at a time that the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to perform hajj, he did just one umrah and one hajj. And that should be sufficient. Okay, now you spoke about burdening yourself and, and being ready for Yom al-Arafah. Uh, Yom al-Arafah, we've seen some of the pictures of those brothers and sisters that have actually been there. Uh, you see people are, are actually crawling and trying to fight for certain spots on the Mount of Arafah. Is this something you should burden yourself with, Sheikh? What I always announce to the viewers, to my students, wherever I go, I say, all the ibadat are very simple and affordable to the average person. Mm -hmm. What makes them difficult? Why people panic before they go for hajj? They simply panic because they want to do things extra. That's not prescribed. For instance, you see people covering the mountain of Arafat. You see white spots everywhere. The entire mountain becomes white. They climb all the way to the top. Is this recommended? Let's see what did the Prophet do. He stood at as the rocks by the beginning of this mountain. And he said, وَقَفْتُ هُنَا وَعَرَفَتُ كُلُّهَا مَوْقِفْ I stood in here, mm -hmm. and the entire place of Arafah, the whole valley of Arafah, not just mm -hmm. the mountain, is a valid spot for standing. Except, of course, there is one area which is known as Batnu Arafah. That is the western spot of Arafah. That's excluded. So in Arafah, there is an area. You see people in, in Masjid Namira, there is an area who say, step back because this area does not fall within the territories mm. of Arafat. And there is an area also in Al Muzdalifa which does not belong to the Muzdalifa, is not a valid place for standing, which is known as Muhastir, Wadi, Batna Muhastir or Wadi Muhastir. We should avoid that as well. Any place. That's why if your hamla, if your group, if your uh, travel agency is taking you to a certain camp that's appointed by the government or the local officials for you, hang around there. Do not expose yourself to uh, the risk of getting lost. People get lost and they waste the entire day looking for what? For their people, for their group. They panic, they're afraid because I don't know what's going to happen next. And they end up walking to Al Muzdalifah, burden after burden. And how much dua did you make? None, because I was busy trying to relocate my people. Why did you have to go to uh, uh, the mountain? Why do you have to go to the Masjid Namira? If you're nearby, offer the salah there and listen to the khutbah. If not, then your party will be sufficient to establish the jama'ah. And your local imam can deliver the khutbah. And every place in Arafah is a valid spot for standing. And when we say al wuqufu bi Arafah, or standing bi Arafah, that covers whether standing, sitting, reclining. Even if somebody sleeps for some time, that is okay. Not the whole day, of course. This is one thing. So in any position, that counts as being there in Arafah. Okay, now we're speaking about burning. We're going to keep on to the topic of burning. I've taken this... This, this burdening from you, Sheikh. What about fasting on the day of Arafah? Now, I know you told us that those brothers and sisters who are not making Hajj, it's for them to fast on Yom Arafah. But what about the Hujaj, the people who are making the pilgrimage? This particular question emphasizes the fact that Al Ibadah means Al Ta'ah. Worship means obedience. Mm -hmm. The one who prescribed fasting for people who are not performing Hajj is the same one who made it disliked and prohibited for people who are performing hajj to observe fasting during the day of Arafah. The Prophet ﷺ forbade his companions from fasting on that day because they were with him doing hajj. While in another sound hadith he said, صيام يوم عرفة يكفر سنة ماضية وسنة مقبلة Fasting on the day of Arafah waves and expiates, remits the sins of the past year and the year to come. But that's only prescribed for those who are not standing in Arafah, making the effort of dua, istighfar, and uh, dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Exactly. I was going to say, we, we know that Yom Arafah is the core part of Hajj, it's the time where you spend time to yourself and give Most yourself time. Most important part, so, al hajj Arafah. So, okay, this is the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, okay, the Hajj is Arafah. So tell me now, Shaykh, why do we hear, you know, many people saying that people actually hasten 
to get out of Arafah, Arafah before the crowd, uh, before Maghrib time, before the sunset time, and and this is the most special time for the most important time for them. Ignorance, lack of knowledge, and you will find the same people who are the same people who are hasting in their prayer, doing the prayer as jumping jacks. One, two, three, up, down, up, down. Assalamu alaikum. The prayer is over, and they're deprived from a single word. If you happen to be in Arafah during the day, you should not leave Arafah before sunset. Unfortunately, some people are naive and innocent. They just follow the mutawif or the muallim mm-hmm. or the travel agent who says, we have to hurry before the crowd, before we have to beat the traffic. What traffic? Everybody is going to the same destination. Everybody is going in the same direction. Why hurry? We are in ibadah already. You should not leave Arafah before sunset. Continue making dua and istighfar all day long and particularly before sunset increase the amount of your dua at this time until the sun sets. Now you're allowed to leave and do ifada from Arafah. Not before sunset. Okay, where's the Muzdalifa coming here? Because I think the same hastening happens when it comes to Muzdalifa. They don't stay. Many people try to cross it. Say, oh, well, we visited Muzdalifa. What is this coming? Uh, maybe you're talking about uh, the luxurious Hajj group uh, who do not take their people to Mina on the 8th, who skip Al Muzdalifa. They convince them, well, we pass by. It's like they empty the Hajj from its great meanings. Al Muzdalifa is a huge open plain which is the next station after Arafah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا أَفَضْتُمْ مِنْ عَرَفَاتٍ فَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ عِنْدَ الْمَشْعَرِ الْحَرَامِ وَاذْكُرُوهُ كَمَا هَدَاكُمْ وَإِنْ كُنْتُمْ مِنْ قَبِلِهِ لَمِنَ الضَّالِّينَ And this zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala glorifying His praise requires time, relax, comfort. Take your time. Al Muzdalifa is one of the mandatory stations in Hajj that if the person skips it, then they have to make it up by offering a sacrifice. The fidya has to be slaughtered, a shia has to be slaughtered uh, in Mecca, and to be distributed on the poor people of Mecca. And you just missed one of the wajibat of hajj. It's a, it's a, it's a big deal. We came all the way to do uh, a fancy hajj. You do whatever you like, and you skip whatever you don't like. No, everything. The Prophet ﷺ did, we must do. And he said, خُذُوا عَنِّي مَنَاسِكَكُمْ So what's recommended concerning Al-Muzdalifa mm-hmm. is once you arrive there, you pray Maghrib and Isha. You pray Maghrib and Isha. Then you pray your witch and you rest until the morning, until the dawn, Fajr. Then you pray Fajr and you start moving, making the Adhkar until you come to the end of Al-Muzdalifa. By the way, Al-Muzdalifa is also called Al-Mash'ar Al-Haram. Mm-hmm. Even though Al-Mash'ar Al-Haram is a small mount, on the borders of Al Muzdalifa and Mina, which is known as Quzah. Mm-hmm. And there is a masjid there or a musajid. This is where the Prophet ﷺ stood and he said, وَقَفْتُ هُنَا وَالْمُزْدَلِفَةُ كُلُّهَا مَوْقِفُ He particularly said, وَجَمْعٌ كُلُّهَا مَوْقِفُ Jam' is also another name of Al Muzdalifa. So it's called Al Muzdalifa, Al Mash'ar Al Haram, or Jam'. Anywhere you end up, that's fine. Anywhere you make the dua in the morning until it is daylight. That is perfectly fine as well. Now, there are a couple of things. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa allowed some of his women to leave past midnight. So women, children, elders, sick people, people who have valid excuses, and those who give them company are allowed to leave Muzdalifah. When? While they are in the bus passing by? No. Past midnight. Midnight is a very important term that we as Muslims, whether you're performing Hajj or not, you have to be aware of it. It is not a fixed thing that we say London time, 12 uh, midnight, mm-hmm. no, or UK time or JFK time, no. The midnight in Islam, in the Islamic day, will be calculated according to the variation of the sunset and dawn. Sometimes midnight falls way before 12 and sometimes it's at 11, sometimes even 10.30, and sometimes at 1 a.m. So midnight will be calculated as follows. You calculate the time between sunset, which is Maghrib, and dawn. If it is 12 hours, then midnight, if Maghrib is at 6, uh, 6 p.m. and dawn of Fajr is at 6 a.m., so midnight is at 12. But 
if the time between sunset and dawn is 11 hours, then in this condition, midnight is only 11.30. What does it mean? It means the following. Number one, that if you are still in your right, or walking from making ifada from Arafah to Al-Muzdalifah, and you feel that you run out of time of Isha, it is approaching midnight, then disembark. Get off your ride, of your bus, of your car. Make wudu if you need to make wudu, and if there is water. If there is not, then do tayammum, and pray Maghrib and Isha. But we're that close from entering Al-Muzdalifa. But you're going to miss the time of Isha. As we said, the latest chance to offer Salatul Isha is midnight. And we just calculated midnight. So it depends what time will it be in uh, uh, Mecca time during this time. You calculate it. And you should not even in your regular time postpone Salatul Isha past midnight or it will be count as Qada. There is a common misunderstanding in the mind of many people. They were taught that by their elders. That Isha time is extended all the way until Fajr, which is false. That's a stereotyping. Aisha's time ends up at midnight. Okay, Jazakallah Khair, Sheikh. I mean, we're speaking about uh, Muzdalifah and leaving Muzdalifah. Now we're entering after doing your Tawaf Ifad, if you do it, there that you're going to Mina. Um, we get some questions from brothers and sisters regarding staying outside of these boundaries that you spoke about. I mean, because it's getting packed, some of the tour companies said, look, you're not staying inside Mina, just on the boundaries of Mina. What are the boundaries? I mean, these, these boundaries, are they set boundaries, Sheikh? Allah the Almighty is the most merciful. Mm-hmm. And uh, Deen is very flexible. Unlike what some people think, it's rigid. Now, there is no sword waiting for you if you cannot do anything according to your capacity. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها And we should keep our duties to Allah as much as we can. So there are set boundaries which are indicated with markers and signs everywhere. حدود منا the Mina's borders, mm-hmm. and now you're exiting Mina. What if Mina is so crowded and there is no spot for you? That's why we say first to those who would like to go to Hajj without the permit, they should not. Why? Because there is a place, an appointed and designated place for each pilgrim who's performing Hajj officially. But, in any case, if you happen to make it to the Hajj and there is no place for you and you cannot sleep in the streets, then the closest you can some people say, oh well, alhamdulillah, there is no place, there is no tent in Mina, so I go and stay in Mecca. No, then you offer a fidya, a dam, because you skip the wajib. So what you should do? You should stay in the closest place to the borders of Mina, as much as you can. Even if you do not really stay within Mina itself. Okay, now we're speaking about Mina, so I've got some, some questions about Mina itself. Okay, besides the stoning of the Jamarat while you're in Mina for those three days, Sheikh. Um, what should somebody do? How should they preoccupy their time while they're in Mina? Like you said, you said Arafah is the day. The Prophet said Arafah is Hajj. But so some people relax after that time. For them now, it's, it's relaxed time. We can spend some time chatting and joking and maybe, you know, watch something, relax. What should we do in Mina? By the way, I relax throughout the entire time of Hajj and other ibadat. It's not uh, something that you have to worry about. You should really enjoy it. Enjoying the ibadah is the key to success, is the key to acceptance. Now Allah Almighty answered your question in Surah Al-Baqarah when He said, وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْدُودَاتٍ What should we do in these appointed days? He says first, فَمَنْ تَعَجَّلَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ تَأَخْرَ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ So whosoever hastens and leaves after two, two days, we're talking about the twelfth of Dhul Hijj. So we return from Muzdalifa to Mina on the tenth. Mm-hmm. The two days which Allah is referring to in the Quran in Surah Al Baqarah in this verse, the eleventh and the twelfth of Dhul Hijj. Whoever hastens and leaves on the twelfth should leave before sunset. But if you're delayed until sunset, then you must remain until the next day and you throw the stones on the next day as well. So, completing the course is to stay until the 13th. Whether you hasten and you leave on the 12th before sunset, or you stay until the 13th, both are valid. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لا جناح عليه There is no sin, no blame upon him. 
But what do we do? وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْدُودَاتٍ We celebrate the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The prayers, we offer each prayer on its designated time, but the four rak'ahs prayer will be shortened into just two prayers. And obviously, there is no related nawafil other than the witch, and of course the two rak'ahs that precede Salatul Fajr, because the Prophet ﷺ used to offer them regularly, even while he was traveling. The Qur'an has different forms and shapes, vary between recitation of the Qur'an, alternate between the recitation of the Qur'an, a dhikr which is regular during these days, the takbirat of the Eid, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Alhamd, and there are different forms as well. Uh, congratulating one another, visiting one another, eating from our Uthiyah, getting to know each other, celebrating the Eid, enjoying the best time in your life in this semi outdoor camping in Mina. Okay, we're finishing now. We're running out of time. Still got a lot of questions. I'm going to try to answer those by way of email. But just uh, one more point, Sheikh. Uh, your last advice to our brothers and sisters, those who have saved up all their earnings, those who have... It's a journey of a lifetime. We've, you know, we all take that for granted sometimes. But this is the journey. What's your final advice for our brothers and sisters? How should they go about preparing themselves? And how should they really act while going towards Hajj? I can't find any better than reminding myself and all the viewers with the hadith Al-Hajjun Mabruru Laysa Lahu Jaza'un Illa Al-Jannah SubhanAllah Yani the prize the compensation for this trip mm-hmm. if it will be accepted is Al-Jannah Man Hajj Falam Yarfuth Walam Yafsuq Raja'aka Yawmi Waladatu Ummu This is our ultimate goal mm-hmm. to have our history deleted Similar to what we do on our uh, laptop. You delete the history. You don't want anyone to look at it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will delete all the history. But not all. Only the bad. And the good will remain still to show in your record. But that's condition and contingent on the following. To do hajj as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did exactly. Since he said, خُذُوا عَنِّي مَنَاسِكَهُ You still have a chance to prepare your intention, to seek some knowledge, to study, to ask questions, in order to prepare yourself morally and spiritually, before materially and physically. May Allah accept from all of us. وَصَلَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى نَبِيِّنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلِّمْ Barakallahu feek, Shaykh. Jazakallahu khair, Shaykh. Well, that comes to the end of this special episode of Ask Today for the brothers and sisters, for you who are going to Hajj. We have many programs specially dedicated to Hajj on Huda TV. Please go to our website www.huda.tv where you'll see an up-to-date schedule on the programs, especially Hajj step-by-step by Blood and Sheikh Sheikh uh, Muhammad Salah, where you'll find all these monastic, how to do them properly. Uh, if you are going, please make off all of us at Huda TV, all the cameramen, all the hard workers behind the scenes. Until next time, I leave you with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. If my love is attached to thee, then from sins I will be free. Each time my heart will beat, your name will resound with heat. Allah is my heart's speech, your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate test.